Hello and welcome back to the Roundup. This week we've got an interesting collection of stories for you. We've got some very good news for PS5 owners who may have been slightly worried. We've got some bad news for Amazon. Again, because Amazon can't do games right it seems. We've got some interesting, what I can only describe as military LARPing, gone a little bit too far in everyone's favourite trash fire of a video game from a couple years ago. And we've finally got something to really take the piss out of in the NFT monkeys. They've gone... Just about as far as one would expect to try to gain relevance in video games, and it's genuinely hilarious. First, let's talk about what I can only describe as the bastion of reasonability in an industry that's otherwise a load of absolute horseshit. Everyone knows Vampire Survivors, right? It's a perfect game that you can... Very limited input, right? There's very limited input. You can just, as long as you've got directions and a confirm button, that's all you need. You're good to go. So obviously it's going to translate super well to mobile. So... What do you do when you've made the game that works perfectly mobile and then it's the biggest cultural hit of the entire year, redefined a genre? Obviously you go to mobile and you can't, can't really do it yourself if you're busy trying to make, you know, the game, the Game Pass deals, all of that, the DLC. The developer Luca Galente said to GamesIndustry.biz, Soon after the initial success of Vampire Forever, so early last year, I started to look for a business partner to work on a mobile version of the game. And this won't surprise you, unfortunately, nobody I spoke with was on board with the monetization I had for the platform. Non-predatory. Those are literally his words. Luke is clearly a good lad. So they brought things a little bit in-house to do it themselves, and they had to do the work themselves, which is why it took a long time. But one of the things that he says was very much a reason why they had to actually do it instead of going, ah, it's fine, was because there was a large number of actual clones. Not games like Vampire Survivors, because, I mean, even I've played a bunch of survivors like clones on Steam. A lot of them are a little bit uh, shameless, but an awful lot of them kind of bring new things to the genre. This is mobile. This is not what happened. He said there were actual one-to-one -one copies with stolen code, stolen assets, stolen data, stolen progression, and they appeared everywhere. Now, add to that the unique expectations you would expect of mobile. They can't go, eh, hey, give us... A pound 80, give us two dollars, give us a dollar, it'll be fine. People don't do that on mobile as much. If you're not free to play, no one downloads it. And that's part of why the whole the industry is quite as bad as it is. So there it is, it's gone, it's free to play. And Ponkel wanted to ethically monetize it. No microtransactions, no battle pass, no blockers to play. You just play the game like you would if you bought it. So thankfully this story actually ends pretty well because Ponkel released it and there you go. It's got 3 million downloads, 60 k installations per day. It seems to be doing fine and it hasn't been beaten out by any absolute mobile bullshit. But that goes to show the mobile industry with the potential of the actual hardware, potential of software developers working there. It's just a trash can fire. But Vampire Survivors is there and you can go play it. So if you're a PS5 owner and you're worried about the recent viral reports that if you have it standing up in its vertical stand or left it standing properly in its box, then it would be in danger. You have nothing to worry about. There was the original allegation from Wolo.net saying that you're killing your PS5 by using it vertically because the liquid metal that cools the APU and keeps it keeps it cool under a lot of load. Part of why those consoles are doing so well is because of unique cooling technology. Generally, that was seen to be a problem from one initial person who found it as working in a repair shop, but that was a one-off. So the problem could still genuinely be real, as it kind of is with all liquid metal cooling. But in this case, it was a misunderstanding. The damage is done. It's all been updated. So it was misunderstanding. Your PS5 is completely fine. PSA, do whatever you want. It's, it'll work. Now, we've got some terrible news for Amazon. And I, I, don't really, I don't really mind, to be honest. And I'm not a big fan of Amazon Studios. But anyway, six years after taking the position, the uh, EverQuest co-creator, John Smedley, stepped down from his position leading Amazon Game Studio San Diego. They took the role and it was stated as this ambitious new project he would lead. It would tap into the power of the Amazon Web Services Cloud and Twitch to connect players around the globe in this thrilling new game world. So this is John Smedley. He, uh, who his history is something else. Uh, Lizard Squad got his flight grounded with bomb threat because he was part of Sony Online Entertainment. He is the one who was accredited with basically killing Star Wars Galaxy before it ever had a chance to get good through a bunch of very interesting decisions. But that's more of the MMO side for this story. Six years for nothing. What happened was he left one uncompleted title that will continue to be worked on by the team under the uh, producer Andy Seitz. That's it. That's just Amazon seemed to struggle to get anything off the ground that they're making internally. They've had reasonable success with Lost Ark, but then that's them publishing. So Amazon seemed to be a pretty effective publishing wing because they can throw money at stuff, get it over here, 
get that on the ground. And that's when you see their shift to publishing makes sense whenever they've picked up the rights to the next Tomb Raider for Embracer. So Square Enix aren't going to deal with that anymore. It's going to be Amazon and hopefully that's okay, but Amazon seemed to be really, really struggling. It's just another story of, I think, a tech company, obviously like Google and Stadia, which we'll talk about in a second, just going into games and going, hey, we, we, we're tech. We understand this stuff. We can do this. No problem. But then when the rubber hits the road, something goes wrong and it's clearly not not quite as easy as they initially expect, which, you know, I could have told them that. And speaking of gaming failures in tech, look at the date. Stadia is dead. By the time you're watching this, it'll be dead a couple of days. But there you go. It's finished now. Google have finally put to rest their horrible mistake. However, they actually did end it with a decent level of grace. Because as they originally announced, there was comprehensive refunds for consumers. Anyone who wanted their money back, just speak to Google, it'll all go back, literally every penny you spent, and apparently also some compensation for developers who would be affected adversely. I know there's a couple of developers who reported that more or less whenever Stadia said, right, goodbye, the developers were left going, but we had a game plan for release after that? What the hell's going on? Which obviously, as we reported at the time, implies heavily that Stadia kind of, or Google rather, made that decision pretty swiftly and then just called the Stadia team and said, turn it off as soon as you can, we're not giving you any money. Sorry, goodbye. Specifically on this is uh, Brandon Sheffield of Hyper Gunsport said, Google did offer us some compensation, but nothing that would beat actually releasing on the platform. Honestly, you can't really expect them to pay you the full whack of money if it's not going to release. So that's fair, but what do you do with a controller lying around? You got your refund? Do you just throw it out? Sure, you'll also have a Chromecast. That's fine. That'll be useful enough. But the thing that people don't know about this, or maybe didn't know until they announced this, is that the perfectly reasonable third-party controller wasn't actually usable with anything else. There was no way to, say, pair it to your PC for just playing regular video games. As the final note in their fairly sad crescendo, a final upbeat note, they're releasing a self-serve tool which will unlock the Bluetooth compatibility for the Stadia controller. They're going down to the ship in a way that's graceful, which is more than I would have expected, and it's more than anything I think they did when they actually started the whole process. Now, it is worth noting that the self-serve tool to do that isn't actually open source, because it seems like Google will likely bring this project back. They'll likely try it differently, but the tech is still there. They spent all that money, they spent all the effort, they will want game streaming at some point. That isn't dead. It's just Stadia as a product fell to shit. So I imagine they'll go, oh yeah, here you can use the controllers. And if I'm being cynical, then, oh, you get used to our controller. Then when we bring Stadia back in under a different guise, we can say, you can use your same controller and you'll have a load of fun. But whatever way it turns out, they actually did a good thing finally. Now, I'm moving to a much worse thing overall. Who Fallout 76. Fallout 76. There was an Enclave-themed group that role-played the villains. And if you've role-played in any capacity in video games or tabletops, then you'll know it's fun to play the villain. It's fun to play the bad guy, especially when it comes to a community. Whenever you get in some form of your life to actually be an asshole, but it's acceptable because that's your role, that feels good. So these people were role players on a server in Fallout 76. So in this role play community, these people were the Enclave Armed Forces. They pushed other players to follow specific rules, tackling what they consider toxicity. These are things that are fully within the rules of the game, but things like legacy weapons, weapons that Bethesda had discontinued but couldn't remove from inventories. I'm like, this is unbalanced. This is no longer fair. Basically, they adhered to their own tier list and their own banned weapons, as well as trap camps. If anyone set up a trap camp, which is something that, you know, a new, a new player or someone unsuspecting walks in, their stuff gets lost, they're destroyed. If you're using one of those, these Enclave, these good bad guys, these disciplinarians, these authoritarians, these, these server moderators, these guardians, they would put an end to you. However, they... <laughs> They took it a bit far. They started griefing players. They started pushing their uh, agenda, their their uh, their law abidingness. They started pushing that discipline on people so hard that then people had to leave the server or report them to Bethesda themselves. And then they they treated their own members like shit too, because a lot of this was military larping. A lot of this was role playing. You know, we'll be very strict. We'll adhere to authority. We'll pull rank all the time. We're the people who are, we've, we've earned this role on this server. The kind of people who might be taking it just a little bit too far, right? And they had new members. So members had to work through joining process, which included interviews, of course, which is re fairly reasonable for stuff like this. Then senior members would review prospective candidates' friend lists on PSN 
and tell them to remove friends that they didn't like. <laughs> Could you imagine how unhinged that would be if you're joining like a guild in, a, in, an, in an MMO or trying to join any other like group like a static in, a, in FF14 and someone turns around and goes, yeah, but you're friends with those sorts. Oh, we don't like those sorts, whatever those sorts may be. We have no idea, unfortunately, because that would be, I would love to be a fly on the wall watching some of this go down. More or less, they started to try it. They started to push even further. They start to control the ability of others to exist in that role-playing sphere, in that community. So, an in-game journalist, Holly Green, that's testament to how good Fallout 76 has actually become for these role-playing communities and these, like, people who actually stick to that game. Because if you've been an in-game journalist, right? That's kind of crazy. But anyway, this Holly was reporting that the EAF had explicitly spoken to four other major groups and asked them to blacklist her. As a journalist, you know you're doing good work when you're being blacklisted by the armed forces. As long as it doesn't go any further than that. But there was just a, a general wave of interest in the group. But people were starting to ask questions about what was really going on. But a couple weeks ago, everything vanished. They disbanded. Because they came under a little bit too much fire. So that's a cautionary tale. Whenever you're building an MMO, whenever you're building a world and you're giving people freedom to roleplay certain elements in it, you do want to make sure they don't take certain elements too far. Unless, of course, you're a developer who thinks that would be very, very fun. I think one of the first cultural consciousness events of people taking griefing a little bit too far in video games was the the World of Warcraft funeral raid. I think that's the one that comes to most people's minds. But I think, ah, I think it's just fun. You imagine the kind of people who are military LARPing and they're LARPing just a little bit too hard. They start to get egos online. And there's nothing, there's nothing worse than an online ego. I can tell you that from personal experience. How do you feel about international sanctions and the inability to pay wages to certain people across the country? Yes, this is relevant to video games. Because motorsport games, the people who have the license for Le Mans, NASCAR, IndyCar, the British Touring Car Championship, they've been unable to pay their Russian development studio because of international sanctions around the Ukraine invasion starting at some point last year. Their Russian office moved to Georgia, but they wouldn't fund anyone to move. They wouldn't pay people's relocation. They said the office is moving to kind of cover their own back and a staff move, sure, whatever. And also a 20% pay cut at the same time. So anyone who moved, 20% pay cut. Real dirty stuff. But then the SEC had a filing with them in November saying they'd actually lost most of their board of directors to resignations around funding disputes. They no longer had enough public shares to meet the requirements to list on the Nasdaq. So things aren't going very well. Then their 24 hours of Le Mans virtual event, which was dubbed the, the biggest thing in sim racing, including like real teams, like real commitment, real planning, real serious stuff. It had two disconnects, multiple incidents where connection details were shared with public. It was more or less an absolute shit show. As Max Verstappen, the F1 champion said, honestly, it is a joke. You cannot call it an event. It's a clown show. And if that wasn't bad enough news for them, now one of the employees, one of the Russian staff, who now allegedly aren't being paid, has suggested, sorry, threatened that they will release the source code for NASCAR 21 Ignition, NASCAR Heat 5, IndyCar, and Kartcraft, unless their pay is reinstated. So things are getting a little bit crazy in certain parts of game development land when you've got full game source code threatening to be leaked by known individuals just blackmailing for their wages. I mean, blackmail for other reasons. You could go, okay, well, maybe that's a problem. But simply asking for their pay to be re reinstated Obviously, if they can't pay it because of sanctions, something needs to be worked out. But if you're the leader in a business, you find a way to pay your staff. Otherwise, you're not doing your job. So, unfortunately, I think this is a case of if they'd paid attention, they maybe wouldn't have lost, I guess, more or less everything. Unfortunate. And our final story. This is an absolute dizzy. You know the uh, Board 8 Yacht Club? Of course you do. Of course you know them. But you know how everything they do is kind of shitty? They took that a little bit too literal. If you have an Ape NFT, first of all, sorry to hear that, but anyway, you get a voucher that gives you a skill-based mint. It's called Dookie Dash. Yep, it's about you trying to find a key in a sewer. And this is a video, this is a video game you have to have an NFT with the group to play. So you would expect it to at least have some form of premium element, right? But no, it's an endless runner. You move around a 3D space in a sewer pipe, collecting collectibles and dodging obstacles in a sewer, dookie dash, 
Yeah. So you can... <laughs> By the way, you can also use your Yip Coins to buy power-ups. Because it's not enough having an endless runner for an in-community that you have to be in, in the community through a buy-in to actually play. You also have to have the full of pay to win elements. Fantastic. Anyway, the way this works is whoever has the highest score after three weeks, they get the key. Everyone else goes to the summoning. This is the next step in the game. And then they have to play more mini games. But yeah, this is literally every time someone's like, NFTs, the future of gaming, it's wonderful. And I know if Michael were here, he would very much say, ah, but you know, the technology blockchain does have its benefits. And that's true. But the most well-known body in the field of NFTs in relation to video games came up with an endless runner themed around collecting shit in a sewer, literally, and you can spend money to get bonus power-ups. There you go. That's exactly what everyone expected. I can't imagine anything worse. I... I struggle to imagine anything literally worse. But that's it for the week. But at least we've got Vampire Survivors on mobile that is in the way Vampire Survivors itself did at the beginning of last year, where it paved away in video games going, could we make a lot of money? Probably. Would it be predatory? Would it be against what people grew up liking video games for? Yeah. Do we have enough money from our Game Pass deal and our millions of sales at like $1.80? I think we're fine. What's that? Free updates for the entire year and then a paid DLC for a minimum price after that's also going to get free updates and also free updates during the DLC that you don't require the DLC to buy for. Sweet. So thanks, Punkle. With that, thank you very much for watching and we will see you next time.